Amen. Good morning. Take your song books. Uh, first of all, welcome to First Baptist Church of Pearson. And uh, we're going to get started here. Take your song books. Stand with me if you can. 685 in your song book. We're going to sing the whole. I know it says just the chorus, but we're going to sing the whole song if His way is perfect. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for uh, knowing that your way is perfect. And we also thank you, Father, knowing that our way is made perfect in you because of the blood that was shed on Calvary for us. We thank you, Father, for that sacrifice. We pray now that you bless. Bless those that aren't here today, Lord Jesus, for uh, whatever reason due to illness or just not able to be with us. Lord, be with our, our church members and also be with our preacher. Thank you for bringing him back and healing him. Just pray, Father, that you continue to bless him, watch over him and his family, and pray with you. Uh, just bless all that we do here today. Amen. All right, we got a couple of things quickly going on, so if we could uh, not stray too far, but make sure that everybody within the vicinity of your arm and maybe across the aisle gets a really big shake and a smile, okay? Shake their fingers off.
All right, as you make your way back to your seats, we got a couple of quick announcements. We want to hurry through these so we can give our Gideon's friends plenty of time. Wanted to read this to you here real quick. This is from the Northern Indiana Youth Rally. This is from uh, uh, Brother Joel, or Pastor Joel, actually, I should say. He's kind of the head of this Northern Indiana Youth Rally things. And this goes to all those that helped out. It says, oh, thank you, First Baptist Church of Pearson, for hosting the rally last month. The Northern Indiana Youth Rally for the month of March will be held on the 13th at Faith Baptist Church, 850 West Business 30, Columbia City. Uh, a meal will be served. I look forward to seeing everyone there. I just wanted to point that out, that he was uh, thanking us. Uh, he was unable to be here. Uh, but that's what you get when you be able to become a senior pastor and you have a son that can take over the youth group. You make him do it instead. Joshua? Not saying anything, but just saying. Not a senior pastor yet, but anyhow. Okay, so we have Gideons here today. We want to make sure we give them plenty of time. 5.30. Oh, look at this. 5.30 choir practice. So all those that check those little boxes right there that said they want to join the choir. Here's your chief. Here's the sign. Oh, 3.30 or 5.30? Um, are we practicing anything? Or, well, obviously we're practicing something. Probably quickly, yeah. Probably quickly. All right. So this is kind of... No audition? No, you got audition. Oh, I got audition? Well, if I got audition, well, that's fine then. I don't, know, I don't need to be in the choir. Anyhow. Okay, so choir practice at 5.30. Be here, please. Evening service. Continuing the message with Brother, with, uh, brother John. With, uh, in the book of John there in the sign language class just right afterward. 11th, 11th, 11th is Wednesday. What is happening on the 11th? And that before you tell me, how about we make some weird sounds that we might hear on Wednesday? What? <laughs> the enthusiasm is just wafting through the crowd. Yeah, we got our fur and feathers Wednesday. Make sure you get them there. Okay, we still have plenty of these tickets here. If you have any questions, see Brother James back there in the back. Uh, these tickets, though they do not say uh, the right date on there, they're still a great reminder. You can write the new dates on the back, or you can also just hand them out and remind them it's going to be on Wednesday. And then Friday, Child Evangelism Banquet, uh, for which I will probably never get to go to because we have youth rally. I'm not bitter. Um, I figured you did. Pastor asked a couple weeks ago if you've ever had one of those meals. It's a really good meal. And I'm like, Pastor, I've never had one of those meals. So he just kind of laughed at me. But if you need tickets, go ahead and see Pastor. Pastor's got plenty of tickets. If not, he can get them. If you're wanting to go, that is on Friday at 6 o'clock, right? 6.30. 6.30? It's at 6.30. The time wasn't in there. So it's 6.30 at Pleasant View Bible Church. Then on the 14th, which is this Saturday, men, at 8.30 because we're the early risers. Oh, we changed it to 8? Sweet, 8 o'clock, all right. 8 o'clock. See, it's in there, it's 8.30. You'd be here at 8 o'clock if you come at 8.30. I'm sorry if you're... You get to clean up. If there's nothing here to eat, you come at 8.30, it's not my fault. 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock. And then on the 21st, we have the Ladies Fellowship. They get a brunch. So that's at 11 o'clock there. And then Hope Children's Ministries on the 22nd. All right, thank you. Did what I mentioned. If you want to go to the Child Evangelism Banquet, you can see me today. That would be great. Am I on? There we go. You can see me today if you would like to go to that uh, Child Evangelism Banquet. The banquet is free. Uh, they do take a love offering for their summer ministries, but it's, a, again, a great meal, and they kind of update on what's happening with uh, Lakeland Child Evangelism. So I would love to have you there. And their speaker again this year, I told you last week, is a dummy. Okay? Uh, it's me and my ventriloquist figure so <laughs> so so you figure out which one's the dummy but anyway uh, Again, I won't be there. Friday night 6 30 but see me if you'd like to go uh, and we'll make sure you get they need reservations early this week so if I could know today that would be great uh, the other thing is on the 22nd the Hope Children's Home Choir uh, from Florida there's going to be about 20 uh, young people with them 20 children traveling with them and a few adults and we are going to feed them on that day we're not doing a church carrying dinner, whole church carrying dinner, but we do need some help. So if you can help, like provide food, you're welcome to stay and eat as well. Uh, but we just, uh, I mean, if you want to 
come uh, and bring food, that's fine, but we just don't want to do a whole church meal because Easter is just a few weeks after that and we got big things there. But uh, we do need help with food or, or money to buy pizzas or something for those kids before uh, we send them on their way after the service. So that'll be Sunday morning, two weeks from the day. Now, there are some flyers on the back table, or some posters rather. Uh, if you, some of you would take two or three of those and post them in prominent places uh, around town and, and so forth, wherever you go, that would be great. We would appreciate that. All right, I think that's all of the uh, extra emphasis I wanted to make. As far as prayer requests this morning, I do.
Lord, I come, I confess, bowing you, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need pastor said, what is the matter? He said, a guest took the Bible out of the hotel room and left a gun in its place. He said, that doesn't sound like a problem. That sounds like a blessing. He said, look, that Bible saved somebody's life. I want to be sure there's always a getting place Bible in each one of my rooms. You know, the placing Bibles in hotel rooms, that probably is what the Gideons are best known for. But we also give testaments, give testaments to uh, young people in both public and private schools from the fifth grade up through college. We give testaments to medical personnel, to emergency and police and firemen, also military. You know, Gideons go to the jail, here locally, we go to the jail twice a month to talk to the prisoners about Jesus. Gideon's and our member wives, the auxiliary. 
they, we attend monthly camp meetings to um, encourage each other and find out what's happening in the 200 countries around the world that the Gideons are organized in. We have well-defined and easily recognized venues of distribution. This allows our ministry to stay focused and be effective and not duplicate the efforts of other Christian ministries. You know, we go where churches don't go, and frankly may not be able to go. And a man can't even be a member of the Gideons unless he is a member of a church in good standing and has the recommendation of his pastor. Jim had, hadn't been a Gideon very long, and Mr. Ellis, a 90-year-old Gideon, invited him to accompany him on a hotel distribution. So uh, Jim was young, strong, and had an SUV. So he said, okay, I'll go. Well, when they're heading out, Mr. Ellis told him where he wanted to go. And Jim's first reaction is, you know, that's not a very good part of town. Mr. Ellis said, we're going to distribute Bibles. They pulled up in front of this motel and Jim continued to protest because his SUV was clearly marked with his business, Christina's Jewelry. He said, this motel is nothing more than a whorehouse. People see my vehicle parked here, they might get the wrong impression. Mr. Ellis said, we are here to place Bibles. And that's what we're going to do. So they went inside and got permission to put a Bible in every room. But then they witnessed. And the manager and four of the women there accepted Jesus. Amen. You know, we praise God for those changed lives. Jim also went to a school distribution. It was a Christian academy, so they were allowed to go inside, and Jim was asked to address the students. Well, he was a little bit um, on the fence about this, because he figured the kids there would probably already Christians, probably already had Bibles. So he said, I don't want you to take one of these testaments unless you promise to read it. So, you know, they passed out several testaments. And later, Jim was speaking in a church service, and a girl <clears throat> in the audience afterwards came up and said she attended that Christian academy. And she said to him, I lied. And he said, you lied? She said, yes. I took one of those testaments, and I didn't read it. But my daddy did, and he wants to accept Jesus. Amen. Again, we praise God for changed lives. You know, about 80% of all the um, scriptures that the Gideons do distribute are testaments that go to young people from the fifth grade up through college. They're young people who are just getting started out in life. But you know, in most countries, the contributions that the Gideons receive aren't enough to pay for all the scriptures that are given away there. So that burden falls on Christians in this country. Currently, the United States is funding 75% of the worldwide ministry. And it's only through your support that this is possible. You know, the dollars that you prayerfully give do, do go. They buy the Bibles and they get the Bible shipped where they need to be. And right now, one of these costs less than a dollar and twenty cents. Average price around the world is a dollar and sixteen cents. A hotel Bible costs five dollars. But I want you to know, however you give, and like the pastor said, we'll be at the back after the service. Uh, but and we, another way to give is the Gideon cards. You see a display there in front. We'll have some cards that you can take with you, so that you have them at home. But however you give. Your entire donation will go to buy and ship scriptures where they need to go so that the person receives them is getting it free, a free gift 
a free, valuable gift that just might lead to their salvation. You know, Jim was a 13-year-old, um, and he was in a hotel room watching TV because his mother was passed out on the bed and his father was out bar hopping. His parents were atheists and alcoholics, and they had warned him, don't you read the Bible. Of course, they didn't have a Bible to show him, but don't you read the Bible. It's just full of fairy tales. Well, he was tired of watching TV. He was bored, so he looked around the room, and he found the Bible, and he was curious. He remembered what they said, just fairy tales. So he opened it. His eye fell on the verse, Psalm 2710. When thy father and thy mother forsake thee, the Lord will take care of me. Amen. That was no fairy tale. That was real. He took that Bible home with him. He had to keep it hidden, but he read it frequently. And today, Jim is a pastor. We thank God for those changed lives. I want to thank you for your attention. Pastor, thank you for inviting us here today so we can just explain to you a little more the tremendous impact your support has on the ministry of the Gideons International. Thank you. All right, thank you, Brother Klein. I will say, too, just so you know, there are some Gideon cards out in the entryway out here in our uh, track display thing. So uh, our church, uh, that's our what we normally do now for funerals and things, we'll just, uh, instead of flowers, we often will just uh, send Bibles in memory of, of uh, a saint who's gone home. So, but those are available there. But thank you so much for coming. And uh, we know if anything, we know the only thing that will change the world that we live in is Christ. And uh, so it's important ministry. Thank you very much. So. All right, 389 in your songbook as we get ready to sing our last congregational song. We'll do it like we normally do. We'll sing all the way through, and on that last chorus, uh, the junior church is dismissed. So on the last chorus, last time through, 389 in your songbook. I need a piano. I need a piano. <laughs> Feel like he's in a Catholic church this morning. Might see going up and down. Three, eight, nine in your songbook. We'll sing all four verses, and on that last chorus, the junior church can be dismissed. On the first, my faith is found.
salvation by my Savior's name. Salvation through his blood. Okay, Junior Smith, church, you're dismissed. I need no other argument. I need no other That he died for me. Thank you for the wonderful singing. You may be seated. If you would, take your Bibles. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to read a verse, we'll open in prayer, and then I'll kind of explain to you where we're going this morning. Genesis chapter 2, and verse 24, I'll give you a clue, in case you can't find it, Genesis comes before Exodus, all right, so you get, all right. <laughs> yeah. At Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, it says this, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Let's pray. Father, I ask as we open your word this morning that you would use it to encourage our hearts, use it to instruct us, to help us, to bless us, Father, we pray. And thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. We're beginning a little bit of a series this morning entitled The Truth About blank, all right? <laughs> uh, that is, we're going to look at some things see what God says about some of the moral and some of the quote-unquote social issues of the day. But the purpose, I want us to be clear, the purpose is not just to hammer on the do's and don'ts, okay? We could preach all day long against sin and condemn people up and down, but that's not the purpose of this series. The purpose is to see what God says, but also to see how we as Christians ought to respond. Not only to these commands ourselves, but how we ought to respond to those who are involved, those who are engaged, those uh, who, uh, uh, who may uh, be struggling with some of these issues that we're going to talk about. So I hope we get that total picture. Today I want to talk about the truth about marriage. The truth about marriage. I came across this uh, little uh, thing uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's when she says and when he says. So just listen for a moment. It says, when she says, it's your decision, she really means the correct decision should be obvious to you by now. <laughs> when she says, do what you want, she really means you're going to pay for this later. <laughs> when she says, I'll be ready in a minute, she really means kick off your shoes and find a good game on TV. At least that's what he hears, I suppose. <laughs> when she says, you have to learn to communicate, she really means, just agree with me. <laughs> All right, now let's flip the coin a little bit. When he says, I'm hungry, he really means, I'm hungry. <laughs> when he says, I'm sleepy, he really means, I'm sleepy. When he says, what's wrong, he really means, I don't see why you're making such a big deal of this. When he says, while shopping, I like that one better, he really means, just pick one so we can go home. <laughs> well, just having a little bit of fun there, obviously, but I want us to see what God's word has to say, has to tell us about marriage. Number one, very importantly, marriage is a God-ordained institution. A God-ordained institution. Here in Genesis chapter 2, if you back up just a little bit, verse number 20 it says, Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found an helpmeet for him. Adam had no one as his companion that was compatible to him. Verse 21, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. God saw Adam's need, man's need for companionship and for intimacy. 
In fact, in verse number 18, uh, even back up a little bit further, God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make a help meet for him. That is someone suited to his nature, someone suited to his condition, someone uh, to, to, uh, to uh, his needs and wants for him. And vice versa, by the way. But marriage is a God-ordained institution. Now, this one wasn't planned, this story, but I think when I was reading those, I thought about the little boy. Uh, in Sunday school, they learned about Adam and Eve and how God took a rib from Adam and made Eve. And, uh, well, later that week, he came come in the house and, and he... I went to his mom, and he said, Mom, my side hurts. He said, I think I'm going to have a wife. <laughs> well, <clears throat> sorry, that one just popped in my head. But anyway, uh, the first thing I want us to see is marriage defined. What does God say marriage is? It says again in verse number 23, he took uh, the rib out of, e, or out of Adam and made Eve. And then he says, verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and it says, shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be, what, one flesh. The Bible defines marriage, God defines marriage as one man and one woman. Nothing else. Anything other than that is contrary to the word of God, and it is sin. It is an abomination before God. God designed and ordained marriage. Man didn't design and ordain marriage. The state, by the way, did not ordain marriage or did not institute marriage. God instituted marriage. God ordained marriage. And so we have no authority, no right to change what God has set forth, what God has instituted. I've come across people, you probably have too, who will say, well, but Jesus, you know, like these that always want to focus on what Jesus said or didn't say. They say, well, Jesus never said anything about same-sex marriage or about homosexuality, about those types of things. Jesus didn't. So uh, those are Old Testament things. Go to Matthew chapter 19 just for a moment, please. <clears throat> we know it's stated other places, but, but that's often the line we hear. Jesus never talked about same-sex marriage. That, that's the argument we heard here a few years ago when uh, quote-unquote same-sex marriage was legalized, right, in America unconstitutionally, by the way, but that's another subject. Matthew chapter 19, though, look at this. Jesus himself speaking in verse number 4, Matthew 19, verse 4. When the Pharisees came and was asking him about marriage, about divorce and some of the things, but verse 4, Jesus answered and said, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them what? Male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man have a father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall twain or two, they shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain or two, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. So you see, Jesus reaffirmed what God set forth, didn't he? He reaffirmed the definition of marriage. He reaffirmed the one man, the one woman, how they shall come together being one flesh, husband and wife. So again, anything outside that, those boundaries are contrary to the word of God. Not only does he marriage defined, <coughs> excuse me, but marriage enshrined. Again, look at Matthew 19 and look at verse number 6 that we just read. But the last part of that verse says, What therefore God hath uh, joined together, let not man put asunder. Not only is marriage to be between one man and one woman, it's also meant to be forever. Amen. It's meant to be forever. When a man and woman stand before God and commit their lives one to another, it means something. Marriage is a God-ordained institution. Secondly, this morning, I want us to notice marriage is a holy institution. A holy institution. Go to Hebrews chapter 13. Back a little bit further in your Bibles. Hebrews chapter 13. I want to notice a couple of points here. The truth is, marriage is God ordained. Secondly, marriage is to be holy. Hebrews 13, verse number 4. All right, are we on the same page? Hebrews 13, verse 4. He says, marriage is honorable in all, in all things, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. 
Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For the Lord has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. But again, verse 4, marriage is honorable in all. Number one, marriage is to be honorable. That word honorable has to do with, with val- it's, it's valuable, it's precious. That's what he's talking about there. It's something to be esteemed uh, far above all else. This matter of, of, of holy matrimony. You know, marriage is more than a piece of paper. It's more than just a convenient living arrangement. Right. It's to be cherished. And it's to be protected above all things, at all costs. And let me just say this, husbands. Uh, you ought to esteem your wife in public as well as in private. There ought never be a time that you shame your wife in public or that you... Uh, uh, that you uh, uh, rebuke your wife in, in, in public. You're to esteem her as a precious thing. Uh, it goes the same thing for your wives, your husband. Don't you dare ridicule your husband in public or in private. Marriage is to be honorable in all things, valuable, precious, to be esteemed above all else. Secondly, marriage, we notice in that verse, not only is to be honorable, Excuse me, oh, my voice is still not quite back, I can see this morning. But look at verse again, uh, we're in verse number four. Marriage is honorable and all, and the bed, what's that next word? Undefiled. Marriage is to be honorable. Secondly, marriage is to be undefiled. Um, and I understand we have some younger people here, but, but uh, don't get too nervous. But just understand, the marriage bed is special. Yeah. Special. The sexual relationship between a husband and wife is not just a concession in order to achieve procreation. It's also designed to share love, to share acceptance, intimacy, emotional bonding, and satisfaction. Sex is intended to be an expression of love between two people who are committed together in marriage. And I will say this, and the Bible says this actually, rather. Any physical relationship outside of that boundary is sin. Whether it's before, after, whatever it is, any relationship outside that marriage bond is sin. And though there may be pleasure in sin for a season, the cost is exorbitant. It's something, forgiven or not, that you will deal with the rest of your life. I'm going to go to one more passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And then I think we'll be done turning, I think. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Let me just read down uh, verses, let's read verse 1 through 5 here. Follow along as I read. Again, we'll not get too much into details this morning, but look at verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 7. It says, Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, the sin we were just talking about, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one another, except it be with consent for a time. Withhold not one another, in other words, uh, from each other, except be consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves for fasting to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not." Husbands and wives, just understand this, belong to each other. Nobody else. They belong to each other. And the concept, uh, this passage deals with the concept of of mutual uh, fulfillment is biblical. Not denying your spouse's needs. Men, marriage is about putting your wife's needs first. Same for the wives. Your husband. Marriage is about putting your husband's needs first. In the day in which we live, a humanist viewpoint puts, uh, puts uh, satisfaction or puts uh, fulfillment in the place of commitment. That is, what do I get out of it, right? Yeah. Uh, rather, our attitude ought to be, what more can I give? What more can I do? What more can I give to put that person first? The emphasis, the emphasis today is all on self. 
the marriage bed is to be undefiled. Now, what are some things that defile the marriage bed? Again, I'm not going to do detail. We have young people in here, but I thought of just a few things I wanted to mention. Things that will defile that special thing that he talked about there, that holy thing, the marriage bed. Number one, adultery. <laughs> adultery. Uh, and let me say this again, not just the physical act, right? What does the Bible say? It says that uh, if, if you, a man looks upon a woman, lust after her, what, he, he's already committed adultery in his heart. That ups the standard, wouldn't you say, quite a bit? He who thinks that that would never happen to me is a fool. Lingering glances, innocent flirtations, compromising situations, all those things lead, if not kept in check, will lead to disaster. In a society that devalues marriage and glamorizes affairs, love affairs, Infidelity is displayed as something normal, even something expected. It promises pleasure, love, fulfillment, but it brings pain, suffering, and destruction. So the first thing that will defile the, the, the marriage bed, and probably the most obvious one, is that of adultery. But I think of a couple other things. Number two, he talked about fornication there in first, or in, uh, back in Hebrews. Um, or actually here in, in uh, First Corinthians, rather, chapter 7. And so secondly, any sexual relationship outside of marriage defiles the marriage bed. You say, well, what if we're going to be married anyway? Or what, if we, what, if we only, what if we don't go all the way? The answer is still the same. You've defiled the marriage bed. Abstinence is ridiculed, portrayed as unrealistic. Well... Listen, young people, I know a lot of people who are sorry that they gave in outside of that marriage, but I, I, I don't know of a single person who ever said, I'm sorry I waited. I'm sorry uh, that I made this special for my husband, future husband or wife. Not a one. Adultery. Any relationship, sexual relationship outside of marriage is defiling the marriage bed, I believe, but I thought of a third thing. And you may think that's, this one's a stretch, but I don't think so. Number three, and it's a prevailing problem in America today and even in churches today, pornography. Pornography. It is a betrayal of your spouse or of your future spouse. It's a betrayal of them and a betrayal of the marriage bed. It, it will affect you negatively both physiologically and psychologically. The, and, and these are secular tests that are secular uh, studies that have found this, all right? Affects you not just uh, mentally, but, but physically as well. You may fool your spouse, you may fool your family, you may fool your preacher, you may fool your friends, but not God. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that which is done in secret is done in the open before God. Now, let me just say this. God doesn't give us boundaries to be mean or restrictive or to limit our enjoyment or our pleasure. He gives these instructions and commands to enhance our pleasure and our joy in the marriage relationship. So as we begin to wind down, let me give you a couple of thoughts here and we'll, we'll wrap up. What then should we do? What safeguards can we implement to help us overcome some of these things that can destroy or affect or, or impact, negatively impact the marriage relationship? Number one, just two things I want to bring out. Number one, guard your marriage. Guard your marriage. Now, there's many ways you can do that, but I would suggest first and foremost, pray for your spouse. Amen. Every day. Pray for your marriage every day for that relationship. It, it, it's, it's very hard to have animosity toward anyone if you're praying for them every day. You realize that? <laughs> but pray for that relationship every day. If you're enraptured by the love of your wife, someone else's wife isn't going to be able to, uh, uh, to allure you very easily. I heard about a fellow, uh, his name was Bob, and, and uh, he was talking to his friend. He said, so, Joe, you say that you won the conversation with your wife yesterday? 
Joe says, yes. She came crawling to me on her hands and knees. Bob said, really? What did she say? Joe said, she said, come out from under that bed, you coward. <laughs> All right, on her hands and knees. <laughs> but seriously, seriously, guard your marriage. Uh, protect it with everything you've got. Secondly, finally, safe, the second safeguard, guard your heart. Guard your heart. This is where Jesus attacked the problem, is it not? Because uh, he said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. There's other things he talks about there, but he says the sin occurs because the lust that first arises in our hearts. So guard your hearts. A couple things we can do in regard to that. Number one, most obviously, we need to hide God's word in our heart. That's what David said, right? He said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. And then also, we need to avoid the object of our lust, whatever that might be. If it means leaving the room, if it means even changing jobs, if it means throwing your computer out the window, <laughs> whatever it means, driving a different way <laughs> to work, to avoid uh, whatever it is that you drive past, guard your heart. Guard your heart. Avoid any compromising situations. Again, you say, well, I'm strong enough. I could. Listen, do you think David ever pictured himself as an adulterer well. and a murderer? <laughs> I don't think so. The one who is declared to be a man after God's own heart. So we need to guard our heart. I've used this before. You've, all of you probably heard this, this uh, phrase by now. But sin will take you further than you want it to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will cost you more than you want to pay. Mark it down. You say, well, at least I don't do this, this, and this. I'm not like that guy. <laughs> well, again, I'll close with this illustration. A man applied for a position in a large accounting firm, and he, along with several other applicants, were called for an interview. But at the end of the interview, the manager said, I just have one more question. What does seven times three equal? The man quickly thinks, he blurts out, 22. That's wrong, by the way. So, all right. <clears throat> well, after he gets outside, he gets to thinking. He says, oh, I blew it. <laughs> As he checked himself, he knew he'd gotten the answer wrong, and so he knew, well, there goes that job. Well, the next day, he gets a phone call telling him that he got the job. He said, but what about seven times three? My answer was wrong. They said, we know, but of all the candidates, you came the closest. <laughs> now, here it is. It's not about who comes the closest. <laughs> Our goal is not to be better than the next guy, be closer than the next guy. Our objective, our goal is to be like Christ. Amen. To please and honor God in all that we do. And so we can, you can justify all you want, try to justify all you want, that at least I'm not here, I'm not there. <laughs> I'm better than this guy, than that guy. God doesn't see that as, uh, uh, as a good thing. <laughs> it's not about being better. than that. It's about honoring, obeying God. You know, sometimes I think we often, we, we treat the grace of God a little flippantly. We say, well, I'll try not to, give in. I'll try not to, to engage in those sounds. I'll try my hardest, but if I fail, at least I've got God's forgiveness. At least I've got God's grace to fall back on. A couple problems with that. Number one, while God may fully forgive us, the consequences of our sin here on earth are not usually remedied quite so quickly. Relationships can be damaged beyond repair. Our testimony for Christ can be destroyed. And secondly, the other second problem is once we give in to sin and temptation, guess what? The devil has a hook, a hook in us. And it becomes increasingly difficult to escape.
now as we close, having said all that, what do we do when we fail? We all fail, right? What do we do even perhaps if we fail miserably? What do we do? We begin again. Amen. Our God is a God of second chances and third chances, fourth chances, right? That's not to be an easy escape. In fact, if that's our attitude, God is not going to forgive us because we've not truly confessed the sin. But, but having said all that, God is a forgiving God. And we can start again. Whether it's in a marriage, whether it's in a relationship, whatever it is, we can start again. And put these principles into practice and honor God in our lives, in our marriage. And the second aspect of that is what do we do to those who have failed miserably? How should we respond? You dirty, rotten, <laughs> how could you, no, how should we respond? What does the Bible stay, say? Love them. Our objective is to restore them uh, as a brother in Christ. <laughs> Take heed, lest you, Paul says, right, in Galatians 6, but restore them in love. That'll be our response. Again, I, we don't change what God says. We don't say, well, God didn't really mean that, or you don't have to worry so much about that. No, we, we, we teach the truth. But when somebody falls, we do what God does when we seek him, when we fall. We forgive, and we start over, and, and we restore one another in love, not kick them when they're down. Love them, restore them. Uh, I heard someone say many years ago, and I've used this again before as well, but uh, he said, the, the Lord's army is the only army that shoots their wounded. I'm afraid sometimes that's the case. You know, we're to bind up the wounds, aren't we? Uh, we're to give them the medicine they need uh, and, and the strength to help them stand once again. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes this morning. <clears throat> future weeks here, we're going to talk about the sanctity of life, we're going to talk about uh, uh, some of the things concerning uh, government and capital punishment, some of the, just the issues that, that might approach us, but this morning I wanted us to focus a little bit on the, the marriage relationship, that which is to be honored and undefiled, as the Bible says. And so, uh, again, I know we're in mixed company, that is, we have some that are married, some that are not married, some that are, that are too young to be married, some that are contemplating marriage, perhaps. I trust you'll take these things and uh, remember what God has said. I wonder if there might be anyone here this morning as we close. This has not been a salvation message. I understand that. But the first thing you need to concern yourself with is your relationship with God. Is there a real personal relationship with him? Say, what do you mean by that? I simply mean, has there ever been a time that you came before God? Uh, that, that is, that you uh, lifted your eyes to heaven, so to speak, and, and you confessed your need of him you confessed your sin that you need him and you called upon Christ who died for you to forgive you to save you to come into your life if you've never done that the Bible says right here right now you can make that change in your life and again it'll be something uh, again I've heard a lot of people who have regretted not trusting Christ sooner but I never heard anyone regretting they've trusted Christ and so I, I, if you're here this morning, you're not saved. You're not, you don't have that relationship with him. Again, I'm not talking about church. I'm not talking about good things. I'm, not, all the th I'm talking about have you, has, have you ever been a time when you made it personal in your life? If not, I want to pray for you. I want to help you very quickly. Anyone like that at all this morning? I'm not sure my relationship with him. Because if that's not right, then these things are going to be, uh, are going to be a, a continual struggle in your life as well. Anyone like that very quickly? I'm not sure. My relationship is going to be about three seconds. Would you pray for me? That's all I'm going to do. Raise your hand, put it right back down. I'll say thank you. And I'll pray for you. Anybody? All right, as Christians then, uh, I wonder if there's some here, and I don't think I'm even going to ask for raised hands. This one's between you and God, but maybe you're struggling with some things in your life. Uh, maybe your relationship is struggling. Uh, maybe there's some things that, that you're engaged in that nobody else knows about. And you need to seek him this morning and, and uh, acknowledge or, or confess your, your sin to him and get yourself back on the path that you need to be on. Um, we're here, I'm here to help you in a way I can, to pray with you, to, uh, whatever I can do. But right now, would you just, we'll take just a couple of moments, give you some quiet time to talk to the Lord. Uh, and uh, 
examine your own heart. Don't worry about anybody else around you. They can take care of themselves. You examine your own heart. Maybe some area is not necessarily wrong per se, but that you know you need to strengthen in your relationship, your marriage, or some boundaries you need to make uh, more clear, more distinct in your life. Whatever it is, give you just a few moments to examine your heart to deal with those things between you and God. Stand together, please. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Let's sing the, uh, I think we probably all know the first verse of I Surrender All without having to use our books. So let's, let's just sing that together. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Prayerfully, meaningfully, I trust to the Lord. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Thank you for coming this morning. And if I can help you encourage in any way, uh, I'm, I'm available. All right. Uh, as we close, just a couple of parting uh, announcements or things I want to mention. Uh, don't forget choir practice tonight. Um, what was the other one? Oh, uh, we are planning a baptism. Uh, we, they, they was going to be today, but the individual is sick. So uh, if you would like you've never been baptized and you'd like to talk about that, come see me okay? would you, as we do this. But, uh, and then the other thing, I would just appreciate just a, maybe a word of prayer tomorrow morning. I want, my wife's going with me. We'll be going to Indianapolis, and uh, I will have the uh, privilege of opening the State House uh, session in prayer. And uh, so never done that before. Uh, a neat experience, I think. But <laughs> so what's that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my goal is not to make the new. You know, <laughs> I've seen some of those fellows, and I don't know if they do much. But anyway, that's for the testimony of Christ. But, but anyway, um, I'd appreciate your prayers on that. All right, thank you for coming this morning. Don't forget, have the Gideons dismissed to the back there. Brother Klein uh, and Brother Heckman, thank you for coming this morning. And if you'd like to give to their ministry, and I would encourage you to do so. I love offering on your way out. Uh, you have opportunity to do that. And, every do- and let me just say this. Uh, and of course, I'm not a member of the Gideons, but I do know this much. Every cent you give goes directly to the distribution of Bibles, all right? There's no, uh, what do they call it, overhead, okay? Uh, the men uh, and, and ladies that are part of the Gideons, they support everything that has to do with all that other stuff, okay? They've committed their lives and, 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 uh, and resources so that everything you give goes, am I correct on that, right? Okay, everything you give goes to purchase Bibles uh, for these different places, okay? I don't know, but I remember when I was in elementary school, and that was when they could still come right in the classroom, and I remember getting one of those little New Testaments, you know? So, uh, and sometimes they still have, they have to use some more creative means, I guess, nowadays in public schools. But, uh, but anyway, pray for them, but give if you can this morning. And if you didn't come prepared to give, uh, and you give later, I will make sure they get it, okay? But uh, they'll be back there. Thank you very much. Let's close in prayer. And uh, Pastor Rich, would you close us, please? Father, have